My name is Gavin Jennings and I'm a specialist shoulder surgeon based in Bath, UK. This presentation gives an overview of trauma around the shoulder girdle. The presentation is divided into three parts. Parts two and three will deal with tendons and ligaments respectively, whereas this first part will concern the bones. I briefly like to recap the relevant bony anatomy of the shoulder girdle. The shoulder joints formed by the ball or head of the humerus and the socket or glenoid, which is part of the shoulder blade or scapula. Other important parts of the scapula include the anterior protuberance called the coracoid and the flat acromion, which articulates with the collarbone or clavicle at the acromioclavicular joint. The humerus is composed of the head, the greater and lesser tuberosities, and the neck and shaft. I will discuss some fractures of the main bones as described above, starting with the most common, i.e. clavicle fractures. For a more in-depth review of clavicle fractures, please see the relevant separate presentation devoted to clavicle and ACGJ injuries alone. Clavicle fractures are very common indeed, representing 15% of all childhood fractures and 5% of fractures in the adults. Many are treated non-operatively, such as those in younger age, children, and minimally displaced middle third fractures in all ages. Significantly displaced fractures, those with two centimetres or more shortening, and those in the outer third, as well as open fractures, are often treated operatively. This is an example of a significantly displaced comminuted Z pattern fracture, which we fixed with a plate. The next example is of a lateral clavicle fracture with unstable medial fragment or near type 2 fracture, which we have reduced and held with an artificial ligament. Moving on to proximal humeral fractures now. These have long been described according to the displacement of the constituent parts. The four parts are the two tuberosities, the head and the shaft. The correct radiographs are needed for the initial assessment of these injuries and are often supplemented by a CT scan. The standard views are a true AP of the glenohumeral joint, a lateral scapular view, and an axillary view. A routine axillary view is often very difficult to obtain in the trauma situation. Instead, we usually obtain a trauma axillary view, such as a Velpo view, as shown. Proximal humeral fractures are often treated operatively, particularly in the younger patient, if the parts are displaced. The two main options for operative treatment of proximal humeral fractures are fracture fixation versus hemiarthroplasty. Operative treatment ideally involves fixation as the results of hemiarthroplasty for fractures are not great. Sometimes, however, the fracture pattern may dictate that a hemiarthroplasty is the preferred option, such as in fractures which split the head or in displaced four-part fractures with poor bone quality. Here's an example of a displaced proximal humeral fracture, which we fixed with a locking plate. Here are the post-operative radiographs. A similar technique can be used for fractures also involving the shaft of the humerus, as in this example. Finally, scapular fractures now. These are a bit of a mixed bag and are generally high energy injuries. They're rarely treated operatively unless there's a displaced glenoid fracture or if there are other injuries around the shoulder girdle constituting a so-called floating shoulder. It's important to assess such patients for an any underlying chest injury of which there's a significant incidence. To finish, I'd like to mention a rare but serious injury to the scapular area which is the so-called scapulothoracic dissociation. This is a violent injury where the scapulothoracic articulation is disrupted, usually in conjunction with disruption of the anterior part of the shoulder girdle. Often there's a devastating neurological and also vascular injury. In this example, the scapula can be seen to be sitting laterally with a fracture of the acromion and proximal humerus. The bony injuries were adequately fixed, as was the vascular injury. 
Unfortunately, the nerve root disruptions proximal to the plexus were not repairable. Thank you for listening to part one of the shoulder trauma overview.